with its complex commerce and means of intellectual communication. Each age must be studied in the light of all the past and must in local history must be viewed in the light of world history. His last point about communication and modern life is fascinating. It seems that transoceanic steamships and the International Telegraph had the same impact on his generation as jet travel and the Internet had on ours. W.E.B. Du Bois made the same point in a commencement address at Fisk University in 1898 and in his Harvard dissertation and thus first book, The Suppression of the Atlantic Slave Trade, he demonstrated how a cosmopolitan American history and global history might come together. These historians knew what they were talking about when they thought something was happening in the 1890s. The 1890s were the first age of modern globalization. 90s for measuring the degree of globalization, that is direct foreign investment, it is clear that globalization was greater in the 1890s than in the 1990s. As is often the case in historical scholarship, contemporary experience and concerns powerfully shape the history we write. And I, I would say if that were not the case, there would be no point in writing history. The creation of new lines in history departments for historians capable of doing this sort of history was the result, I'm convinced, of the post 9-11 revealed ignorance of our relation to the rest of the world and the disastrous foreign adventures of the Bush administration based largely on a neoconservative commitment to American exceptionalism. I think deans and provosts responded to a department chair who realized that she might get better results with a plea for America in the world than for a position defined as Jacksonian America. Okay, so I've given you a bit of what I think are the sources of this kind of historical revisionism that is going on. Uh, now I want to give you a little bit of example of what it, what it might mean to our understanding of American history. My first point is that American history has always been embedded in global history. In fact, global history and American history began with the same sequence of events at the end of the 15th and beginning of the 16th century. I'm, of course, referring to what historians call the age of discovery. But I want to argue that the important discovery of that period was not the Western Hemisphere by Europeans. Rather, Columbus and then Ferdinand Magellan, whose expedition, though he was killed in transit, circumnavigated the world, made world history and global history one. Without a little bit of explanation, that little comment may sound like verbal mumbo jumbo, world history and global history one suddenly. So we must ask, what was the world before Columbus? From the time of the Greeks, several things were known. First, that the Earth was a sphere. Second, the Greeks accurately measured its circumference. Third, the Greeks knew that in theory... Oh, thank you. Third, the Greeks knew that you could, in theory, sail west to get to India. But they believed the ocean, which is a Greek word, was the outer, an outer boundary that would block any such attempt. The great discovery was that instead of being a barrier, the, ocean, the oceans of the world connected all of the continents. To Adam Smith, this discovery, which made possible the global trade and capitalism as he understood it, was the most important event in human history. I might put a couple of other things, like the invention of agriculture in cities, but at any event, it was important. There's another ancient truth that was modified at this moment. Jews, Christians, and Muslims, as adherents to the Old Testament, had agreed for centuries that the Afro-Eurasian landmass was the space where God pulled back the sea to create earth, for Adam and Eve and their descendants. That was the world. Hence, the world and the globe were not the same thing. 
They became the same only when America entered or re-entered after a 20,000 year absence into the history of Afro-Eurasia. So my point, which I hope I've shown, is that American history cannot be separated from global history. We are in it from the beginning. I should note that the Afro-Eurasian world was well known, well traveled, and linked as a single trading unit. When Vasco da Gama, the Portuguese explorer, rounded Africa and established a Portuguese trading relationship on the Malabar coast of India. When he arrived, he was met by two Arab traders who spoke Castilian. Soon afterward, he met a Jewish trader from Poland who spoke German, Arabic, Venetian, and a little Spanish. A little less a less happy indicator of the unity of the Afro-Eurasian world was the rapid movement of the Black Death from Southeast Asia to Europe. Asia was far richer and more developed than Europe. The Ottoman Empire, which controlled most of the land route trade between Europe and Asia, was far more advanced in art and science, war and economy than Europe. Europe moved out onto the oceans not because of its superiority, which we often assume, but because of its dependence, its sense of dependence. Could they find cheaper routes to the east? Could they avoid the Ottoman monopoly? China had the technology and skill to go out on the oceans at the beginning of the 15th century. Their great admiral of the time, Zhang He, who established trading relationships throughout the Indian Ocean, including the coast of East Africa, commanded a fleet, a fleet far superior to Columbus's. Columbus's largest ship, the Santa Maria, was 85 feet in length. Zhang He's was 400 feet, and he had several of them. Uh, but the Chinese had no motive to go to Europe. Backward Europe had nothing they wanted. The commonplace account of American colonization is linear. The spatial aspects are ignored. That Puritans settled in Barbados, Honduras, and the Indian Ocean is, fair, is rarely mentioned, but it does raise questions about our sense of the image, our image of the Puritans of New England. The Dutch foundation of New Amsterdam is treated as if it was intended to be modern New York, and its racial and religious diversity is used to make the point of its anticipation of modern American diversity. That line of thinking appropriates for U.S. history what is really a history of a Dutch global commercial empire. Ignored is the near simultaneous settlement of Batavia, today's Jakarta, which had far more diversity than New Amsterdam and was far more valuable. When in 1674, a moment uh, when the Dutch had an opportunity to trade Suriname for a recovery of Manhattan, they chose to keep Suriname. Seems an odd choice now. But at the time when sugar was sweet gold, Suriname was far richer and far more promising as a colony.